So when you are speaking of the results and outcome in your church, we say things like this, to say that six of 10 youths between 16 and 19 years attended church and became active leaders over the last two years. Can you find that kind of data in your church or in your ministry to give me this accuracy? Or eight of 10 homes in this area have at least one member of our church. What strategy or structures will you use to capture this data and then measure it? Sorry, am I too far away or near you? Am, am I cool? I need to know so that we're, because you have to go to implement these things. Very, very important. Then six of 10 streets have at least two cells with seven people per cell. These are things you have achieved. Remember, they are outcomes. The first was the plan. Now is what has happened after you implemented the structure. Now, this is what happens. This result immediately tells you the capacity and capability of your ministry. So you are praying the people are coming, but you don't have capabilities to hold them because there are no structure. The work of the ministry is only 20% 20, 20 of it. Only, only, no matter how you do it, you preach, preach, preach. Preaching is only 20%. Less than a quarter. Preaching is only... Two, the hardest part of the work is behind. No matter how beautiful your car is, if you remove the engine and do the body very well, are you going anywhere? No, sir. So the anointing may be solid, but there's no structure to support it. When Moses got tired of lifting his hand, what did they do? They built a structure around it. <laughs> All right, next slide, please. So those are examples of outcomes. So next one. Now, so let's look at some of the structures in ministry that you need to have. Number one, you must have a church ministry structure, the things that you do in front. Okay? Then you have a leadership structure. How do I grow? If I become a member today, what do I need to do to become senior pastor in your ministry in the next two years or three years or five years or 10 years or 15 years? Maybe I'll ask Pastor Yemi. Maybe we can send the slides to you. Okay. All right. We will send it to you. All right. So you also have administrative. So listen, the slides will come to you if you, if you registered with your email administrative structure. Now, let me tell you something. Many times you do church on Wednesday or Thursday and on Sunday, then you wait again till Wednesday and Sunday. What happens on Tuesday? The first timers cards, new converts cards, cards that came, what happened to it on Tuesday? Who extracted the data? Administrative structure. What do they do? And then your inreach and outreach structure. There must be a structure. We can go out for evangelism. We have gathered all the 15,000 names. But who is going to process it? We, we have reached them, but we cannot engage them or process them. The next one, people development structure. People must know how to be developed spiritually and in leadership or in any other part you have chosen in the ministry. And then financial and investment structure. That's very key. Pastor has already explained that, so we don't need to go deep into that. If you are going to last 20 years and you don't have a financial strategy in ministry, that's a big issue. Because you don't want to put pressure at the point of growth. I'll show you uh, uh, some of the slides. Where you are then looking for the funds to buy a venue. Should have been ahead. If you are prudent with the structure. And then, of course, business and resources structure. Some ministries develop businesses, but pastor is still the one managing the business. Mm. You are pastor. Create a CEO. Or a COO. Don't run it two together. You'll get confused. You can't track your debt. You can't go and borrow money from the bank as you. You'll be exposed. Your risk level is too high. It will affect the brand of your ministry. So you have to separate it. So somebody is owing you as pastor, businessman. You go and fight and call police. But the person is your member. And the person whips up emotions. Pastor has bullied me. Pastor took me to police. 
and they will quote that scripture to you that if I'm owing you as a member and you're my pastor, what did the Bible say? You should leave it. <laughs> so your project structure and of course your technology. Listen, in this day and age, if your ministry doesn't have a technology structure, Jesus is coming soon. That's the only reason I can say. That's the only reason I can save you. Because if you don't have a technology structure, what it means is that because the highest point of attraction resides in technology now, attraction, not retention. Retaining them is still, I love, love what um, Pastor Koji said yesterday. So retaining them and touching them is still very, very physical. But attracting them, where are the youths today? It's in, it's, it's, they're online. They're in those places. So, the elements of your structure should be, what is the load-bearing part of that structure? The governance. How do we lead our people? And then the document, active manuals, not the ones you have kept away. Active manuals that you can see. And people know. When you get to an organization, they give you an induction manual. The manuals of the organization and the processes that you use in this profession. In the same way, you must have it in your church. As the Spirit led, inspired men to write the scriptures, so the same thing for your ministry. To write the manuals for your ministry. So that the people who come later can take on the mantle and continue to run. Why must everything stop and start with you? You can't be the only one that knows how to do everything. On stage, you are using eye to control everybody. You are distracted. Why? Because the element of the manual is not there. Processes and workflow lines. Policies and standards. Now, so it looks like, as we are dealing with ministry, why do we need all this? You know, it looks like, does it, is, this, is this really important for ministry? Is it not too boring? <laughs> Let me tell you something. If you don't have structure, you will work extremely hard, reach the curve, which I'll show you, of 15 years, and then it will be extremely difficult, if not impossible, to pass a particular number that your ministry has ever reached. It, it won't happen. Because, like Pastor, what you said yesterday, you have reached the limit of your learning. And you have locked that ministry in that perspective. If you want to unlock it, build structures. If you are just starting your ministry, oh, fantastic. Follow this pattern. And understand it. If you go to, what, you must ask yourself a question. Why do you find the extremely old Orthodox churches fully established 100 years, 200 years later? Why? What's the difference? They have developed structures and processes that people can continue to run with. If the newer generation churches or Pentecostal churches don't develop the same thing. The prescribed rate of ending or death of those ministries will keep rising. For every 10 that starts, six or seven will shut down within three years. Why? Because the anointing is not ministry. It's important to separate it. Ministry is the service, is the act, is the process that requires a back end to do it. There were groups of women whose job was to fulfill the pre-going of Jesus to any place for his crusade. That was their job. Before he went, they were already there, sorting out issues, structure. He was not the one that was then finding a venue and looking for this and did this and organizing the food. All the food they were sharing, all the things that was happening, how do you know that they were sharing food? It says because some, even though they did not come for the word, they came for the food. It's okay. All right? And then the relationship and interactions, authority lines, and the report and data. Next slide, please. So this is an action step for you of a guide of what you need to do and build into your ministry so that you can be free and do bigger things. Now, if you want to develop your structure, there are certain things you must look at. Ministry structure is a function of the vision 
strategy goals and your objectives. That's number one. So you can't go and copy another person's structure. It will not work. In Nigeria, we like to do something. Hey, they are doing pure water here. What do you do? You go and do pure water. But he did not understand that there was some data. I find it interesting when they call consultants to come and rescue a business. And we say, so where's your business plan? Where's your structure? And they say, actually, we just started. We don't know. I say, eh. when we say go and employ a consultant, you say no. But you, are en you have entered trouble in the middle of the race. You have come to call. I say, shut it down. Then we start all over again. It says, ah, after all this investment, I say, yes. Shut it down. We'll start all over again. Why? This place is not suitable for this business. Move it. All right? So ministry structure, capacity, and capability design are functions of number of ministry dimensions. I'm going to talk about this a little later, about ministry dimensions that you have. Sometimes you are very supernatural driven. That means you are a miracle driven church. It's not negative. But that's the, that's the way you come across. Or that's what God has told you to do. Your structure cannot be the same person who is driven by books and resources. It's, it's not going to be the same. All right? And then the last one is ministry structure, front end, back end are functions of, a, of your arrowhead strategy. Arrowhead strategy is the primary thing that you are known for as a ministry. If you, do, if you have not understood your arrowhead strategy as a ministry, it will affect the way you are structured. Now, I find something. So, uh, we went to do some work in a particular location, and they were, they were talking about some very interesting things they wanted to do in ministry. And I said, so let me see your team. And they brought two ladies, one in her 50s and the one maybe in her early teens. I said, okay, these are the two people. Ma, what are you? I've been pastor secretary for 20 years. Sister, what are you? I'm the one that runs around in the office. Eh. Okay, we are coming. You need to build a team behind what you are trying to do. The era of anybody who can, doesn't find a job to come and work in church is gone. The proficiency rate, the quality of thinking, apart from spirit that the person needs, is high now. Just, you, do, you can find work, come and work in church. Then on, you, get, you get to church on Monday, then the person is head on the table sleeping. Hey, how? I hope, am I still relevant? Okay, I have just a few minutes. Next slide, please. Sorry, just let me make a statement here. So this, can you go back, please? So this, your, whatever structure you build, organogram, whatever it is you build, make sure you think you are three or four years ahead of your current place. So that you can, you have left space for expansion. That's why I talk about your capabilities. We are doing a project for a particular, and I asked the question, how many people can get married in your church in a month? And they said, no, ah, we do only one Saturday in a month. How many people say max two? I said, so, you have grown your church to 2,000 people, two weddings in a month, times 12. But you are praying for your members to get married. But you have developed a structure that cannot make it happen. Am I, is it relevant? You have brought 1,000 people to church, but your foundation school can only accommodate 100. Now you can see that you need to go back and look at that. So go ahead, please. Next slide. So look at the dimensions you may have. I mentioned these dimensions before. These dimensions will affect the way you operate in ministry. So whether you are supernatural, like I mentioned, or you're community-based, or spiritual activities, that means you're a praying ministry, or you're a word ministry, things like that. Or you're resource-driven, business, product, and, and stuff like that. Or you're programs, or you're administrative, like those that, that have a lot of, you know, branches and structures around everywhere. Or you're music and art. So first 10 people in the body of Christ in Nigeria comes from your church in the music industry. 
you know, things like that, or you are basically what teaching. This will affect what? It will affect the way you design your structure because you must design it to meet this. All right? Next, next slide. Now, what does this structure do for you? What must the structure fulfill? If you have not been writing, you have, you have gone back home. Note this one. Because I'm about to use some words that are going to be a bit off. They are not normal ministry expressions. The first one is that the, the administrative structure must design people. You know, that sounds funny, but let me give you a, a simple example. Every time you see somebody, it says, that person goes to this church. How come? It was not just the spirit. There was also an administrative system that codified the person to become like that. So you just see, you say that, you go to that church. There's something that they did to you every time, made you dress away, make you talk in a particular way. It's like a factory where people are produced. Is your church that kind of factory or is a warehouse where people are just kept? Nothing happens to them. So people design and then process design and then engagement and participation. The administrative structure is what designs the people to become engaged and participate. You have 1,000 members, but only 20 people are participating in ministry. Then you can see that 2% of your total, that's not okay. Are you seeing it? And then retention and development process. You have decided to stay in church. I have retained you. So for every 10 people that come, are you able to retain two or three or four? Hello? It's many times it's surprising that <laughs> when we ask database questions with ministry, they're not able to answer. If I ask questions of 2022 as December or annual, because many times the reports are very descriptive. They say things like, oh, we just want to thank God for a wonderful year. God was miraculous. In, uh, uh, we experienced miracles in many ways and things were fantastic. So you have those, those generic words that when it comes to administration, and I ask you deep questions, how many people came to this church throughout last year? How many total first-timers did you have? How many of those first-timers were retained? I came to your church on the 2nd of February last year. Where am I today in my development? Pastor Bimbo talked about the shepherd who had a hundred. As he was going, one was lost. He says you should know the state of your flock. You should know the state of your flock, right? You should know them. And that state means... Where is this person today? Remember I talked about codified membership. If I have attended foundation school and I, or, or membership school, then I've attended another senior one. Have I become a member? Do I know the doctrines and dictates and tenets of the gospel according to your ministry? And what does that make me? Does it give me any growth in hierarchy there? And then tracking and reporting. Every month, there must be something that gives you numbers. That gives you numbers. The first set of numbers that you must deal with. And let me say this. If you are in ministry or you pastor a church and you are above 47, one of the first data you need to gather is your demographic. How many men are in your church? How many women? What is their age range? That demography will tell you a lot. If you don't do it, what will happen is that something will shock you one day. When you are looking for able men who are agile and able to run, the Bible says that they will tell you, ah, uh, you know, I'm married and um, there are some things I have to go and do. No, I cannot go. I can, eh? We should go and open a branch in Candle. I cannot go. My wife said I cannot go. Number two, is that when you're con your council, all of you are 57, 58, sorry, 47, 48, 49, and above 50, 
you find that you are very protectionist. Any new idea that comes to you is met with you know that kind of how dare you these are the pillars of the ministry some of the things you are doing have expired they have expired they can't work why? because at that, the time you engage those things you are at a particular age now you have passed it it's no more relevant All right? And then unifying members and executing projects. So these are the things that your structure should deliver to you. Next one, please. Am I still relevant? Okay, I'll soon stop so that you can ask questions. I have a few minutes. Now, if you want to test whether your structure is okay, you have structure, you want to test whether it's okay, this is what you must do. Ask yourself, does my structure help me deliver results consistently? If I achieved 60% growth last year, this structure, did it, will it help me now deliver 70 or 80 or 90? Does it give me standardization? Does this structure help me to think in systems rather than in individuals? Is this structure transparent? Is, it repeat, is that result repeatable? It says all these things for ministry. Yes, sir. So when you look at a ministry that is growing massively in size and in space and in number, it says, how are they doing it? And this is how they are doing it. But the issue is because many times those ministries will not tell you they employ a consultant or that they are doing structure at the back. It's only what you see in front. And it says, oh, the, the, the Spirit of God just moved. He moved. <laughs> uh, I was working with a particular ministry in, in the East. And we decided, I don't want to mention the names because, you know, and we decided to take a particular town. And we came up with a strategy a few years ago, 2020, 2019, 20, no, 2021. And we decided a particular area. And that, that environment is mostly markets. It's a market town. So I said, if we want to engage this town, all the men wake up in the morning and go to the market. Why are we going to preach in a different place? Haven't you realized at 12 o'clock every day in those markets, there's a ministry that does prayer for them. Do you think they're joking? Why don't we create a parallel strategy and test it for three months? <laughs> uh, I was supposed to work with them for maybe three months or so. We ended working together for about nine months. Started in December, I, I ran away in October. Because, first of all, they were very shocked that how come they've never thought about it before. I said, because you don't go and give water to a man that is not thirsty. And don't give a heart a gift that is unrequired. He won't value it. Even though the gift was nice. But I don't need it. Why are you giving me this thing? So we just pass. So when you are able to pick to the hearts of the people what they require, you will see that the need is met. Jesus, Jesus understood that they were fishermen and used those language. That they were farmers. He met them there. He preached from the boat. But you are preaching to people. You have imagined the kind of people you should have. But you are not able to meet them. Why? Because you have not developed them through your structure. So these are the things. So is your structure characterized by agility, transparency, accountability? Pastor Yemi talked about accountability. The pastor, if you do, see, let me say this. If the pastor is not willing to be accountable to the structure, don't build it. Because you are pastor on Sunday and Wednesday, but on Monday or Tuesday, you are office administrator or CEO or something. And you must conform to the administrative structure of that ministry. So that I can pick example from you. It is not your preaching that will give me administrative example. It is your administrative skill. 
Next slide, please. Next slide. All right. Let, next slide. Let me just move away from this. I, I've mentioned this already. Good. Look at this slide. If you are developing your structure, first ask yourself this question. Pastor Paul, you talked about this yesterday. Some ministries at growth level, that means they are missionary. They are still very active, like a plane taking off. So you see their numbers are growing. These things are happening. Now, your job through administration is to keep your ministry at that missionary level in such a way that you keep reinventing yourself to produce higher growth. Now, the challenge is that sometimes you not get to a plate too. You are coasting. Yesterday, we were 500. Today, we were, 300, we were 410. Next, tomorrow, we were 602. Then we came back to... Do you understand what I'm saying? We just keep... That means you are already at that plate two level. If you are not able to create new interventions, those arrows, red, green, and yellow, to reinvent the ministry, what will happen? You will go down. Now, Pastor, what you said, you just see the chairs, we just be disappearing. What? <laughs> the ushers can be very smart. As the chairs disappear, they will pack the chair and hide it on, behind the curtain. <laughs> but you see many other indices that show that growth is declining. You must find where you are. Why? Because the administrative structure required for this, for missionary, is different from institutionalization. It is important, it is very, very important to develop an institution because that is the strategy to create longevity, to take the ministry beyond you. You're already in your 50s or 60s. Is it that when you go, the ministry ends? Is that the end? Or are you going to leave it into the hands of somebody else? Next slide. So, the, admin, the ministry processes are a collection of formal and informal policies. Do you have policies? Do you have procedures? Are there established practices and methodology that is designed, that can be read by others? That's what we're talking about here. If you don't have time to go back and design it, all right? Next slide. There's a slide I want to go to. I, I need to... All right? So we've talked about this before, that ministry structure is designed to execute your vision. One-time programs may reveal your potentials and possibilities, but the average weekly trends reveals your capacity. So if you like, do program. We were 2,000. When I'm doing analysis, I'll remove that program data from it and take only the weeks you didn't do program. It is, ah, yes now. Because that program was just a little intervention. I will take it out and analyze you based on your weekly without the programs. All right, next one. So culture is your cultural competitive, your structure is your cultural competitive advantage. It is that thing that gives you, it, it feels like grace. Because once you, things enter your structure, things just begin to happen. Things happen automatically with structure. It's like a factory. All right, next slide. Let me show you the factory principle. Let me just go on, because I want, to, I want people to ask questions. Next. Next slide. I'll just show you the factory. Next slide. I've talked about this. Yes. I'll take two slides, and I'll stop, so you can ask questions. I said something earlier. Your church can be like a factory, or a warehouse. You have to determine that if people come to your church and stay for three months, what will they become? If crude oil enters into a factory and it comes out on the other side, what does it become? Have you ever wondered, where do they take those boys who become terrorists? What, what do they do to them? Where do they go and strap themselves and go and explode in the market. They went somewhere and they became something. That's what we want to look at. Next slide. Aha. 
So this is it. You attract imputes to your church. You process them. And I use the word process because the word you preach, the ministration of the Spirit, the foundation school, the programs is processing. Be it transformed by the renewing of your mind. How? The washing of the, by the word. There's a washing and it's the systems you have designed to process the people and they become what? Outputs. Says, ah, why are we doing it like that? Because that's how it is. So you ask yourself, look at, if you close your eyes and look at your ministry, look at everybody there. It says, how come everybody in this place is like this? You produce them. You produce them. How come everybody in this place, in my ministry, they don't have car? You produce them. How come they always look in a particular way? You produce them. Why? Because you, whether consciously or unconsciously, this was what you did. And it gave you feedback and you looked at it. So you may stand and flog them with words. It doesn't change anything. Because the processing system makes them become. Next slide. Okay, before we go to the next slide. Now, I was talking about something before. How many weddings can go on in your church per time? How many baby dedications can go on? How many people can you process in foundation school? But because that process tells you about the speed, the capacity in the middle process, capacity and capability, and the velocity of driving this. I know for some people, this is the first time they're hearing all this kind of hulaba, I mean, balab. You understand what I'm saying? <laughs> how, efficient are, how efficient are you to deliver those people? The quality that you're looking for. Next slide. I think I'll stop at the next one. Next one. Aha. Uh -huh. I'll stop here. Then you can ask questions. Now, if you look at this, what are we designed to produce? What kind of people are we designed to produce? Your process gives value creation and transformation activities. If your church process is not giving value creation and transformation to the people who come, that means you don't have a structure. You have a warehouse. What do they do in warehouse? You store. You store the people there and then you open the warehouse and let them go. They didn't change. The Bible says that when the disciples went back home, their family members and neighbors took notice that something had changed, that they had been with Jesus. He processed them. David acquired disgruntled men, broken, in debt. Abi, They were all in trouble. By the time he processed them through his factory, the Bible described those men as what? It says one day, he felt like drinking water. He says, ah, if I can just have some nice chili drink. Before he knew it, what happened? They broke through to go and collect it and brought, and brought it back. These were guys that were what? Dejected, broken, in debt. Suddenly, he produced them. So look at your results when you get back to your ministry. Look at output. How many members do you have? You are the one that processed it. How many leaders do you have? You are the one that processed it. How many pastors? And then the one that is most interesting is that you have people, all their job is to be liking you on social media, but they will never do anything with you. They are just liking you. Liking you. <laughs> Nothing. Because your social media space has not processed them to become. They are just liking you. And another set will be following you. And you are happy, oh, and me too, I'm happy for you. But how does that translate? Social media can be very deceptive. It doesn't, everybody is following you there, but it doesn't translate to here. So you don't find any metrics that changes you. It can give you brand presence, but it doesn't give you brand growth. So you check what impact are you, and then some of you are sharers, just, they will just share for you. Sharers, they can just share. But anytime you want to do anything committed, they will not join, they will not participate. Is it bad? No, it's not. But you must know what you want. 
If you are designed to be a social media ministry and you get those last, there's no problem. There's no issue. All right? So you have to look at this and determine and go back and build structures so that you are not just a factory warehousing people, congregating them without processing them. There are many action steps that I believe that this conversation we've had or this might have created. It might be important to think for a minute before we go into the questions. Based on this 50 minutes of talk, what do I need to do? So please, can you take your note and write five things you need to do when you get back home to your ministry, where you traveled from? What do I need to do so that I can begin to experience the level of growth that is required? I'll just give you a few minutes to do that. While you're also doing that, <clears throat> you can also write a question, if you have. Write a question and... We can give it to one of the ushers to bring it. So I can take a few questions before my time is up. You have, oh, you already have the questions. Oh, beautiful. Oh, paper. Okay, there's paper for question. If you have a question, please. Paper for question. I hope I was relevant to you, though. So first, you are writing your five to-dos when you get back. And secondly, you're asking questions. Any question you have found, please bring it so I can start answering so we can keep to time. Can I move to the next slide, please? All right, Is, has any question come so I can answer that one? Thank you. You have written what you want to do when you get back. Anybody wants to share? And you have also written a question or two or one. Please write the question clearly so I can see. I'm not carrying my glasses. Sometimes it's, it's tricky to switch pastors from the pure spiritual mode to an ad administrative mode because they look at things nearly always from a spiritual perspective, forgetting there's an administrative part that they need to develop and, and invest in. Invest in. You have to invest in good people. I've said that before. Any questions you have written, can you pass it? Let me just, okay, sir. Thank you very much, sir. Okay, so where is the place of the Holy Spirit in the, transfer, in the transformation of the people? The transformation of the people is by the Spirit. Thank you, sir. It is by the Spirit, and we know that in the Bible. But you have the responsibility to share the word and to design the type of word that you share. So that transformation is not just what the Holy Spirit will come and do without your agency. That's why you take them through the foundation school and process them with certain words and doctrines of righteousness. So you are not eliminating the Holy Spirit. That's why I asked that question on the first slide. Does structure and data eliminate this Holy Spirit? We all said no. Okay? Then, how do I build structure in a church that has been in existence for over 10 years? Now, thank you, sir. That's a very important question. If the church has been in existence, let me tell you something. If you go to a panel beta's shop and they want to respray your car, nice looking car, they wanted to respray it. What will they do? They will first do what? They will, if you are there, you'll be unhappy. Thank you, sir. Why? They will first start scratching it, rubbing it, scraping it. Abby? The Bible says that for you to grow, what would Jesus do to you? It's not just the bad branches that he will cut. Even the one that is productive, he will first cut it so that it can extend further and in the right way. So if you have been in existence for a long time and you want to re... You have to, in fact, redo, remake, 
makeover. Why? I heard Bishop say something one day. You can't repair a foundation. I have not thought about it. It's true. When we are building, if you make a mistake with the foundation, you will re- the best you can do is to, re- is to build, do another foundation around the existing structure and build on top of that one and break the one inside. Many times, I, I was working on a project la- a late last year for a, a certain ministry, and they saw that they were on the decline, significant decline. They were moving down very rapidly. And I told them, we will shut down this thing. Ah, the fight. They pursued me away. They called me recently and said, guess what? The speed of deceleration is faster. I said, but you know. Why? Because you are completely disconnected with the people that are with you. The people that are with you are not the same people that were with you 10 years ago, five years ago. They are different. So these ones are looking at you like, eh, hey, pastor. Really? <laughs> so now they're not listening to your message. They're looking at the iPad or phone. So you have to go back and say, let us Look at this thing all over again. What is our structure producing? Good. What rates? What capacity? And redo it. If it's not producing the results, so if it is producing results, you redesign and move on. Okay? I'll try to answer. I didn't know that I would get so many questions. Please, do you do training for the church and ministers? Yes. What is the difference between, sorry, can you read, what's this? What is the difference between people design? No, what's this one? Between. Oh, between people design and, and design. oh, okay. Have 10 oh, yes, I can see, okay, I have 10 minutes, oh, okay. Process design is, this is how people will come to our church. When they come, we will do guests um, welcome. From guest welcome, we will go and do um, infilling or baptism of the Holy Spirit. And then we will take them for water baptism. And that's a design of how people come and go through. People design is what kind of person do I want? Having come to this church, what will they sound like? How come that you will hear somebody, two minutes you know the church it goes to? Do you think it was an accident? It wasn't. There's something they do to you there that makes you become like that. For years, you can't even get rid of it, even though you have left the ministry. Am I correct? How come? That's what the people design is. Okay? Let me take another one. Okay, I have 10 minutes. What can be done to drive church growth and membership sustainably? Number one, is develop a structure behind it. No. Number one is to divine your arrowhead strategy as a ministry. If, you are con- if your ministry message is confused, people don't know what you stand for. Let me just keep this here. People, listen, human beings gravitate towards where their needs will be met. Did you hear what I said? Human beings gravitate towards where their needs will be met. The need that of the people you are reaching, if you design a particular group of people, I want young people who are below 30, you are going to face certain things with those group of people. They are going to have the need for job, the need for mobility, the need to marry, the need to have children, and the need to jackpot. So, once you have designed yourself like that, that already tells you what's going to happen. So, if you want to grow, first design that need. Secondly, design your message. Let it be clear. Then design the structure to keep capturing. If you don't have an administrative structure that does outreach effectively, you can't grow. Because Averagely, for most ministries we have worked with, what happens is that between reach, okay, this here, between reach, awareness, interest, decision, and action, we reach 2,000 people, only 20 people remained after three months. You do a big crusade, 2,000 people came. Three months later, we are looking for, if you came through that crusade, raise your hand. Only 20 people. Of these 20, how many have become something? You don't know. So, did you have to go and reach 2,000 people? 
I'm not saying don't reach 2,000 people. It's just, it's just a question. So, the growth is very dependent on how you are designed. So, when you are praying, you know exactly what you are praying about. Let me move faster. More questions. Okay. When administrative task becomes monotonous with a short fall in anticipated projection or Okay, when your administrative task has become monotonous, that means something has ended. That means that administrative task should be converted to technology-based. Anytime there's administrative task that is monotonous, look for a way to convert to technology and do something else. Sending emails, automate it. Sending SMS, automate it. Sending reminders, automate it. All that can be automated. All right? Can we use the method for upcoming ministry, absolutely. If you are just starting, do it right. Do it right. How do I build structure? Oh, I'm not talking of structure as in land, though. So how do I build structure on the land that is not ours? That's not what I'm talking about, too. Hey, we, hey. Does the structure work for an online ministry that all the executives are online? Yes, build your structure online as well. If, you're, if your ministry is virtual, look for the most appropriate structure that drives that kind of environment because there are many businesses that drive online primarily and everybody is online. They're all virtual the same way. So you can build that as well. But it may be slightly different. All right. How do you build a structure for a ministry that is beyond beyond 20 members, knowing that you do not have enough workforce. The structure is not just about the workforce. The documentation, remember the elements of structure. There's documents. The document should have been created before the people come. When they come, they know what to do. When you are employed, it is not when you come, they give you job description. But it's not when you come that they'll start designing your job description. They had a mind of what you were supposed to do before you came. So when you came, you started doing it. They advertised for you in that specific way. Does that make sense? That's very important. So you don't, mix, you don't mix that up. It's better to start now. How do we build cell system, house fellowship, and retain it? Hmm. That's another kettle of something. Cell ministries or cell systems and home care fellowships uh, the first thing you need to understand is that design your cell ministry or cell system from the perspective of an evangelical engine. You are using the cell ministry or cell system as a process of reaching people in smaller groups, in smaller areas. And those small groups will bring more people to church. Make sense? They'll bring more people to church. If you drive that, the people who win the souls at that basic level will hold the people they have won. And then they'll start growing from there. So a cell of two, they become four. From four to five and all that. My time is up, yeah? Yeah. Okay. Can your environment affect church growth? Absolutely. The environment you are in can affect church growth. If you, for example, build a ministry in a particular environment that is predominantly a particular tribe or something, and you're not designed in that way, that means you're not designed to locate them or to reach them. So redesign and look for other expressions of your ministry. That's the last one. Okay, that's the last one. Look, look for other expressions of, of your ministry that suits that category of, of people. You understand? Very, very important. I'll take just two more. Can I please suggest ways for, oh, for follow up. Follow up is one of the most unique and effective strategies for church growth. If you design a follow up system, and this is what, there's a particular, let's fire away in the slide. There's a particular slide that shows that follow up, I, from review we find out that churches follow up for three, three or four we, uh, uh, weeks or four, maybe five weeks max or seven. But follow up should last 23 weeks. 
Oh, yes. If you look at your system, how long does it take me to become a coded member? That means initially my follow-up is come. Have you become a member? The second follow-up is come. Have you started the process? The third follow-up is come. Have you now started doing spiritual activities? After that, you can see the, it's a process of becoming. It's not a process of have you stayed? Because people decide 23 weeks later, I'm not doing again. I'm leaving this church. But you have stopped following them up at that time. If the cell system is active, it will capture them. It will know when they begin to show signs of distraction. And you say, what is it that you don't need? Then the cell system or the home fellowship will hold them. Apart from that, they are gone. And you won't know until you see the numbers are significantly dropping. Okay, let me just take two more. In a church where 80% of the members come from, come from far, and most times they complain of transport constraint, what do you do? First in Samaria, then in where? Judea Abbey, and then to the uttermost parts of the earth. What about the people that are close to you? If you decided to build a church far into the bush, that means your brand must have been strong first, or your spirit is stronger than your brand, whichever the case. <laughs> then you have a transport system to bring people. There are some things you dare in ministry. You know it's the only spirit, or it's only the only spirit that can tell you to do those kind of things because nobody will follow you if it's just you. No matter the charisma you have, they will not follow you. It's only the only spirit that can make you do this. Go and build a, a church in the bush. It's only those, you know, Bishop now. He will pull you by the spirit. <laughs> so it, it need, you need to be very, very clear about that. If, you're, if you are not reaching the people that are around you, look at your structure again. Why? Okay, I've answered this one. Finally, thank you very much, sir. Can you... Okay. So, I think with all these questions that we have looked at and these thoughts... We've looked at church ministry. I told you something. This conversation is three days, but we've tried to do it in an hour and 20 minutes. That's why it's important. I've touched many things. I didn't touch some things, but, you know, it's okay. Maybe next year, MLF will continue <laughs> to look at issues one by one. I've given you a very broad view, but next year we'll start digging into it one by one. One area I didn't touch is your staffing. Your staffing structure must be designed in a way that it enables church to grow faster. The way you employ people to support you in ministry, if it's not people who are not just loyal, they're loyal and skilled. If you can't find people that are loyal, uh, that are, if you can't find people that are skilled, train them. You have to train them. You have to train them professionally. Train an editor. So when you see those programs on TV, it says, ow, how did they do with the Spirit of God? No, they were professionals that did it. Carry the Spirit of God in them. But if you are not willing to invest in that kind of structure, you can't get the results. You can't. So look at your back end and train the people. Not just train them, invest in them significantly. Listen. Invest in them in a way that they will not be looking elsewhere. He says, ah, but we don't have the money. You have the spirit. Abby, you have the spirit. So when you do, you will find that your work is easier and you can grow. Finally, data is one of the most important things in ministry today. If you are not gathering data, then there's a big issue. You must gather data so that the data can give you more informed reason why you are the way you are. If we work with any ministry, first thing we do is to take your data from the past and give you an interpretation of how your ministry is. Not what you say, what we will see there. No matter what you tell us, we'll look at your data and that will reveal many, many things to us. Pastors, ministers, and brethren, thank you very, very much for the opportunity. And thank you, Pastor Yemi and Pastor Bimbo, for the grand opportunity as well to share these thoughts. Let's pray. Father, we thank you in the name of our Lord Jesus. We worship you. 
We magnify your name, O oh God. The structures that we require to enable our church growth, to sustain what we have, and to see newness, we receive insight for it. Everything we have received today, we take action by your spirit. Not just that we heard, but we're here to do. We're here to implement and to get the required results. As we go, you enable us to fulfill these things and we'll see the growth and come back with testimonies. In the name of the Lord Jesus, we have prayed. Amen. Thank you very much. God bless you.